Okay, so hi everyone. I'm Amy Sumner. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I replaced Mike Hermanson as the Water Resources Manager at Spokane County. Um, I worked with Renette on doing the aquifer monitoring, and so um, hopefully this will do everyone's uh, work justice. Um, I'm also going to be talking about our aquifer protection area. Um, it's called the APA, it's a fee um, that supports all of our monitoring and education activities. Uh, so some background on the aquifer protection area, it's um, authorized under state law and it must be approved by the voters in the affected area. So each municipality has to opt in in order to be a part of the aquifer protection area and then that allows their uh, citizens to vote um, uh, to pass the APA. And it's allowed for 20 year periods um, there's very specific things that we can spend that money on, um, and that's listed in law. So you can develop a comprehensive plan, which we've already done back in 1979, I believe. Um, and then anything towards implementing that plan, uh, it can allow for construction of facilities for treatment and water quality improvements, such as sanitary sewer, Stormwater, public drinking water, which is of interest to you guys. Um, you can also use that money for monitoring and inspection of on site sewage disposal systems, enforcement activities, and groundwater monitoring and public education. And that last bullet is primarily what the county uses our money for out of that big fund that gets collected from these fees. We also distribute money out to the municipalities that participate, and then they get to decide on how to use those funds um, for within their uh, boundaries. Um, Do they have to follow those same categories? That's correct. Okay. So the APA in Spokane County is primarily located over our Spokane Valley Rathburn Prairie Aquifer and some of its contributing areas. It comes to about a monthly fee of $1.25 per household or $15 per year. And that hasn't changed in the 40 years that we've had this um, protection. Uh, it supports uh, my whole uh, department and our staff in aquifer monitoring and education programs. Like I said, we redistribute the rest of that funding to the municipalities for their use. Um, Originally, it was approved in 1985 and renewed in 2004. Um, with that, as I said, the municipalities have to decide whether or not they're opting in, and the city of Spokane opted out in 2004. Um, something to note is when the city of Spokane opted out, it barely passed. Um, our current APA is expiring in 2005, so we are in the process of trying to get it on the ballot and uh, put it up to vote again. We hope to do that of August this year uh, so that we can continue operating for another 20 years. So this is what the APA looks like. This darker blue is the current APA area, and then uh, like I said, the city of Spokane got our city of Spokane um, opted out in 2004, so they were included in the original, but not when it was uh, reauthorized. So just uh, I want to share some of our accomplishments, at least within uh, Spokane County, what we have done with those funding. Uh, we have served uh, about 56 thousand students since 2010 met like interacted with most of those <laughs> um this represents 14 of our 19 school districts in the county 60 percent of those students where we know what school district they come from are from the five school districts overlying the aquifer so central valley east valley west valley uh, Spokane Public Schools and um, Mead. Mead. So, um, and we've been doing uh, on-site education uh, since the Water Resource Center opened. 
And since 2018, the amount of people coming through the Water Resource Center has doubled. Um, so we're seeing a lot more people coming on site rather than our educators going out to the schools. For our water quality monitoring program, we have done routine sampling of 51 monitoring locations uh, over the aquifer for 21 different parameters. We coordinate with 12 of the water purveyors in order to get um, samples from the production wells. We do annual reporting of all of our data, and we just completed a 20-year analysis from 20, uh, 2009 to 2019. Did I do that math right? No, 1999 to 2019. Um, and all of that information is available on our groundwater monitoring website that I'll uh, take you through. And I just want to thank all of our partners that allow us to get our samples from their production wells. Um, without those folks, we wouldn't have all the information that we do. And I just want to point out that they did not contribute to uh, the presentation. So don't blame them for anything that's on here. It's all me. Uh, she just shared. Oh. She just shared. Yeah. So I'm gonna take you through a little tour of our groundwater monitoring uh, web page and show some of the tools that came out of our 20 year analysis. Um, the actual report is really dense. It's over a hundred pages. Um, so if you need a way to get to sleep, I highly recommend printing it out. <laughs> um, you can get the report as a full report or you can download individual sections from the website. It's really data heavy, a lot of graphs, really long. Um, so to make something more public friendly, we created two sort of interactive um, tools for the public. The first is our interactive Tableau database. So this is great because if you guys want to see some data for your wells that we're pulling samples from, you can go onto this web page. You can select a well if you want to get Liberty Lakes information, for example. You can select the well. If it'll let me. Oh, I think it did. Just oh, there we go. And then you'll have all the data down here, but it's pretty cluttered because all of the parameters are selected. So if you want to see calcium, let's say, this will give you the data for that 20 year period. Um, unfortunately, we do not have water levels for the purveyors because we don't get that information. We can only collect our manual water level um, from the monitoring wells. So you can get that information if you were to select on a monitoring well and look at that. You can also multiple select. So if you want to see the cross section where the river influences, um, you can look at conductivity and you can tell that the, you know, that there's different things going on. So that's this. You can go in here and download the data if you want to use it. If um, an interested citizen calls up, you can point them to this to get some data about what's going on. Um, so I think that it's pretty handy. Is that um, a key boss on there? What was that? <laughs> Don't Don't keep on. On there. <laughs> not, not yet. <laughs> no. Um, I hate that acronym. <laughs> <laughs> so, in addition to that, uh, this uh, twenty-year um, story map kind of summarizes the big points from that really thick technical report. Um, it keeps it in a kind of small screen here and kind of truncates it. So if you want to see the full screen, there's a link to it. Um, so you can scroll down, it provides some introduction. It thanks all of our partners. Um, it, describes our monitoring network, which ones are monitoring wells, purveyor wells, and springs. Um, 
It goes through and describes them for the public, what they look like, um, talks about all the parameters we sample, and I'm just kind of going through this really fast because you can go through it yourself. Um, provides pictures of the things that we do, make it interesting for the public. It talks about our drinking water standards where we've seen um, exceedances, which aren't very many, um, fortunately. And it kind of goes through some of the secondary standards and has maps of where we're seeing higher concentrations and exceedances. Um, the big part for the county was a lot of our APA funds went towards sewering in Spokane Valley and up north to reduce nitrates because we were seeing high levels of nitrates due to the septic systems. So we wanted to address that. Um, so the big thing is, here's all the septic systems and shows how we replaced over 75% of the septic systems in the valley overlying the aquifer. Um, it goes over how we did that in phases, talks about different things that affect nitrates. You get a little snapshot of all the data collected since the 60s and 70s. Um, pause that. Uh, here's the big thing I wanted to show everyone. So these are all of our trends for nitrates. The green arrow is pointing down is where we've seen decreases. The yellow circles is where we're seeing stable levels, which isn't a bad thing because that means it's not going up. And then we do have these areas where it's coming up. And if you just wait a second. You can see, talking about our wellhead protection area, this is one of those um, wellheads, and some of the nitrates are coming in from across the state line. And nitrates don't go away very well when the water is oxygenated. We have highly oxygenated groundwater, so that's partly why they're sticking around, and you can still get that effect um, of it coming through the aquifer. Um, so this section talks about the Spokane River's influence on the groundwater, and so I'm not going to go through all of this in great detail, but it gives folks an idea of like what that um, river aquifer interaction means in terms of groundwater quality. Um, so you can kind of look through that. And then there's another section on our confined aquifers. We sampled two different confined aquifers, one in the Hilliard area. And it talks about the differences that you can see in those um, wells where one's up on the unconfined aquifer above the confined, and you can see the differences. And effects. And then the other one is in Plant Ferry. And so we kind of look at another, um, the East Valley High School monitoring well um, as a comparison. And it just kind of, again, shows how that um, confining layer protects the lower aquifer. For Plant Ferry, it actually changes a lot of uh, geochemical conditions that create um, a unique water chemistry. Um, it's one of the few locations that has very acidic water. Otherwise, our aquifer is very basic, um, meaning it has a pH of above seven. And here it's um, usually around, see if I can remember, um, four, around, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty low. And so it, um, affects things like nitrates and um, arsenic and phosphorus and dissolved oxygen is real low too. Yeah, dissolved oxygen is really low too here. So it's just um, a very unique condition in our aquifer. Um, so that is the story map in a really, really brief overview. I highly recommend that you can go through this because this is a lot more fun to look at and read than that really long report. Um, I think I'm the only one that had fun putting that thing together. <laughs> so um, yeah, if you guys have any questions, 
comments, concerns about what you're seeing on here or um, what you're reading in your little summary uh, handout, feel free to contact me. I'd be happy to talk about any of those um, data that we're getting. And yeah. Good job. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. Ron, did I miss anything that you wanted to well, add? Oh, no, it's not that. Um, thank you. I mean, that was fabulous. But I think we're really prepared. I mean, obviously, we're here to inform you about you know, our program and, and, um, and to seek your support. Um, you know, we're very lucky in this community to have an aquifer that's um, where we actually have an opportunity to, to have a second set of eyes on. We know that you all conduct regular monitoring as part of your operations, um, but um, we hear often, you know, in conducting our, you know, doing our educational outreach, people go, well, who's keeping an eye on you? You know, is anybody monitoring? And um, and as you well know, as, as water purveyors, uh, in a lot of aquifers, you're it. Um, and so um, it's, I think it's it's a benefit to our community to be able to have you know an organization that, that can look more holistically at the author um, and respond to concerns that you may have about water quality as well, um, you know, larger issues. And so um, we're right now going through the process of reaching out to the city of the valley, the city of Spokane, the Lake, um, you know, and talking to their public works departments and and, and then we're looking forward to getting in front of the elected officials and, and providing this very similar information. So um, our message is that you know, our, our education program is, is just wildly successful. Um, thousands of students every year and, and growing. Um, but to have the opportunity to, um, to monitor the offer and, and actually see things before they become problems. Um, you know, I, I'll point up to the West Plains. You know, by the time we started looking up there, it's, it's contaminated. Um, and I'm a hydrogeologist by profession. I've worked in the consulting world for many years before coming to the county. I have yet to see a groundwater pump and feed system that actually worked. Okay, you can pump water, you can treat it before you can put it in the pipe, but reclaiming uh, contaminated aquifers is is a losing battle, and so we have an opportunity here to to, to keep an eye on the aquifer. And I think it's very telling that that in the northern part, the northeastern part of the aquifer, where there still are not, it's still not sewer, and it's up against the rural areas of Idaho, we're still seeing elevated levels of nitrates come. So it's it's nice that we have that monitoring and we're able to see that. And identify that now, and and I, I hope that the community, you know, can react to that, and and get that area sewer. So, so anyway, we see a lot of value in uh, in, in having an APA, you know, for a dollar twenty five a month, you know, for um, for the average citizen. And to us, it, it it feels like a good part, but we also recognize that. In today's world, there are you know, there's a lot of competing um, needs, and and so. Anyway. I have a question. Um, Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, besides um, talking to the different city, um, um, mm -hmm. what do you what kind of media campaign do you have in mind for getting the general public to vote? Yeah. Well, the. Uh, I'll, I'll speak to you know, 20 years ago when I first came to the county. The county did not, it just put it on the map. And, and, uh, and, and as, as Amy reported, it just prepared the past. Um, we have now been, uh, I, I've been talking with, with our public information officers, both Pat Bell with the commissioner's office and with uh, Martha Lou. Um, Lately, and who is a uh, public information officer for public works? Where we've already started giving them information um, and, and like this sort of outreach, um, you know, talking about what the APA is and what it has 
accomplished for the community over the last 20 years. So we will be going out and promoting that. Now, we can't act as county employees, we can't actively go out and lobby for it. We can present information about the APA, but we can't actively go out and, and tell people, you know, please vote for this. And we, we can say it's a good program. But we can add this link to our websites. You sure can. can. Yeah, I mean, and if you could give us a blurb of why, why it's important to the customers for each one of these water districts, I would imagine that most of the water districts would be willing to put that out in their newsletters or billing inserts or something so that people are aware. Yeah. They may not even know what it is. And if you don't know what it is, you usually say no. Right. When you're voting. Yeah. That's my experience. I don't know what that is. I can't find the information I'm not voting for. Mm -hmm. So we could be an advocate. I mean, I'm speaking for everyone kind of off the cuff here, but it seems like it's to our interest to make sure that the aquifer is protected. Well, we could certainly write up, you know, something, you know, that's that's not, not too old to talk and explains what the program is and and share it with with you know all of the uh, um, water providers in the community. Of course, it's Pretty it awesome. does, does that slide present or does the site give the kind of history that we get? Yeah, there's some of that history in there. We also have an APA website that um, that story map and other of our web pages are now linking to, so that if folks especially on our education page where people try to sign up for field trips. We put on there, our program is funded by the APA for more information go here, and then we link to our APA webpage. Um, so we're trying to do that a little more. Some of our staff started putting little taglines at the bottom of their signature page on their emails that say, you know, our program is funded by this for more information go here, so that we can get more traffic to that website. The website's a little bit dated, so we hope to update it, but right now it provides all the basic information. We'll even us getting our, that information to the front end people that answer the phones if they get a call about what is APA, whether or not that quote. Yeah. Yeah. Share that. Yeah. And well, when, when we start sharing that information, including the water providers in this community will definitely be on this. So you said it would be reauthorized in uh, 25, beginning of the year, middle of the year, end of the year, is there is it, voting? The, uh, the, the fee is collected through 2025. And so um, the, uh, it, if, it, if it goes to the ballot this year, as, as we're hoping, and we're still really awaiting to get uh, approval from our commissioners, because you know, they're looking at what other things are on the ballot, and then we're also being respectful of uh, other communities and you know, other items that may be on the ballot for different municipalities. So, um, so I don't know, getting back to your question, it goes through the end of 2025. If, it, you know, if we're able to get it renewed this year, and we'd rather do it in this election because it's much less expensive to do it in, in a regular election year than, than in 2025. And it would cost significant hundreds of thousands of dollars more. Mm -hmm. it, it is amazing to me how expensive it is to put something on the map. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And so at any rate, we're, we're, we're hopeful that we can get everything in place by, uh, by May of this year to the uh, elections office. So that it can go on the ballot for August of this year. And we're and our thought is that during the summertime is when more people be thinking about water and it's just like it's just more present in people's awareness. Um, I had another question. Sure. It's kind of like a I guess two or three prong question. How or if does the APA like interact with the say like just the county sewer services or do they have any involvement in like the regrowth boundaries or anything like that? I'm just kind of thinking like sur sewer services, I think, tend to follow urban growth boundaries. And now, I, I guess I'm just kind of curious yeah, how the well, urban growth boundaries are kind of stuck right now. Yeah. So, so there's what are, any discussions that we're having right now about sewering is, is really kind of filling in in areas. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, we've used significant portions of APA money uh, to pay down uh, debt um, on our wastewater treatment facilities. Um, for the most part, APA, uh, we, we use sewer funds to uh, to fund the engineering and and then a lot of the construction of the sewers. Okay. Um, so the uh, as Amy mentioned earlier, we 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 could use some of those APA funds for engineering and then and of course you know, construction is so expensive. I mean, just just as a we currently have in the bank about just a little over yeah. six dollars in the APA fund right now. Our Amy's program spends about five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars a year on education and monitoring, and the rest about about five hundred thousand dollars goes back to the city of Valley every year. Um, about sixty, seventy thousand dollars goes to the Um, and then they can use those for for water related purposes. So, um, you know, our we could use the money more broadly, you know, in terms of providing engineering and sewer service. Um, but we're, we're currently not we're using it primarily for, for monitoring and education. And then it gives that money back to the community. Well, it looks like Doug had a question. Yeah. He was trying to get in there. I think he just didn't know if he was muted or not muted. Oh, is that it? Yeah. Oh. He's having a sidebar conversation. Oh, but uh, I think like the 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 meat of that that program is is a long term monitoring, continuing that along because a lot of these additional expenditures that can be made by leveraging APA dollars mostly are informed by the long term trends, right? Um, and that's once you stop monitoring, then you just have this black hole. And what are you basing your well, your management decisions off of? If, just, if, yes. the, if the APA is not renewed, yeah. then um, very likely the county will we will continue our education program, but we won't be doing monitoring. Yeah. And that's monitoring helps out because even though we test, I also supply your information because it's a third party. Well, and we're and we're it's testing in areas where this is going to be right. And like we're and so we're seeing we're seeing nitrates coming, you know, we're seeing nitrates trending up in the northeast portion of the aquifer and and it's confirmed by data coming out of uh, Idaho and the monitoring that he used. Yeah. So, well, it's not just nitrates, right, Rod? I mean, eventually, if you're able to continue, there's always emergency, well, emerging chemicals of concern. You know, I, I don't want to come across as too much of a hand in your bed. No, uh, but, but in, in the 20 years that I've been in the county, I've seen no significant um, changes in stormwater policy. Okay, and but what I have seen in 20 years is I've seen we've gone from checking the box on nutrients locally, and which puts us ahead of nine out of 10 communities in Washington State, right? And we're looking at toxics, we're looking at toxics much more affirmatively than any other community in the state. Um, and looking at PCBs in our effluent and now uh, in PFAS, um, and so. We've got the you know this toxics advisory committee that that, that ecology is really is, is putting uh, effort into now. Um, my predecessor spoke a great deal about it, Stan Miller, and as he was going out the door, he was talking about stormwater and threats to stormwater. And a lot of what he was talking about was metals, metals and nutrients and those. Sort of well, those threats are still there. But there are more, and and again, I've seen no meaningful. I don't know if meaningful is the right word. I just haven't seen a whole lot of progress in stormwater with respect to monitoring 
even investigate, looking at the impacts of virtually every drop of stormwater generated in the city of the valley goes directly into the ground. Um, and we know from, from the city of Spokane and the work that they've done in, in, in looking at the stormwater system and, and removing grit from the stormwater system, there's a lot of uh, toxic chemicals that are coming out of, of the, the catch basins and uh, the stormwater facilities in the engineer facilities. So in the city of the valley, there are no engineer facilities. It all just goes right into the ground and into the water. And I, and we're not looking that closely at that right now, just not. So that's the, yeah, that's what I think is, I'm gonna be retiring soon, you know, but I just think, I think in the next round, this is gonna be coming on. The indicator that we're seeing right now too is chloride, chloride is going up all across the aquifer and i mean that's been in the aquifer atlas for 20 years now um or since the first one came out so uh i think uh looking at that we did a brief uh, year-long study to look at chloride bromide uh, ratios to see where the source of the chloride is and the only time we got above um, a detection level for bromide was up north where there's still septic systems. So it gave us that septic system signal of fluoride, but everything else is just in the range of dilute groundwater slash rainwater, which I guess could indicate stormwater in some sense. And then you're seeing those parts. So I think that's the scientific sort of link to that consideration for the future. I mean, we we could go and mine all of our our compliance sampling from all of our wells, and we maybe piece together a subset of what the county's data tells us. But some of our sampling schedules are like test for things once every seven years. What happens in that that void space? Well, if, if not for for the monitoring program, um, we won't know. Um, so, well, one of the things that we see looking forward um, is is additional interaction with this group, you know, and asking a question about, well, are you concerned about other contaminants out there, you know, that that might not be regularly monitored? You want to look there or not? We're not going to we're not in the business here of going out. And putting y'all in an uncomfortable situation, you know, but at the same time, I think it's in the best interest of this community for everybody to be eyes wide open about what the threats are. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, <laughs> we have the capability, we have the tools in this community with, with the funding mechanism and you know, with, with the local government that has the, the, the people in the process to, to do that type of monitor. And it's, it's something that not a lot of communities have. So, anyway, we're hopeful, you know, that, that we can get the, the support of, of the elected officials and we can get it on the ballot. Again, I'm looking for the support. Yeah, I, I need to look into what what we we can do, and, and I'm thinking specifically for the relation from our district, what what they can do in terms of advocating, um, or if that's in the solely in the hands of our our elected officials. I don't know, but uh, it, it definitely needs to be talked about openly uh, in in the coming months. Mm -hmm. um, Right. There's going to be a lot of people at this election if you get it on the ballot. I can only <laughs> I, can, I can only speak for myself, but I you know I can tell you that, that that when a message about water, water quality, water quantity, conservation, you know the just all all the messages that that, that are coming out, you know, the IWAC, the videos, 
I think that the message, when the message comes from the water providers, it, it is so much more powerful than when it comes from the staff person, you know, you know, a face of the county like me, you know, but when you're the trusted professionals and you're the ones that, 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 that people look to as the water providers. And so you have a great deal of credibility um, with, with your customers. Um, and, you know, it, you're encouraging customers to be mindful of water quality or, or to conserve water and whatever. I just think that it's a much more powerful message when it comes from you, the credible sources, the professionals who, who do it every day. Awesome. Well, thank you, Amy. Thank you, Rob.